This Week in Startups is brought to you by 8Sleep, the first bed engineered to improve your sleep through dynamic cooling and heating, detailed sleep tracking, and more. Get the sleep you deserve and supercharge your health and productivity at 8sleep.com slash twist. And Zendesk, the best customer experiences are built with Zendesk. Qualifying startups can join their startup program and get Zendesk products free for a full year. Visit Zendesk.com slash twist today to get started. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and this is the show where we talk to entrepreneurs about starting companies and their vision for how they want to change the world. We also talk to investors. Sometimes we do a news roundtable. I know you guys want more of those. We're going to try to do more of those in the future. And we started a 10-episode series called Scaling Your Startup. And this is the 10th episode in that series. And you can find all the information about this 10-episode series at thisweekinstartups.com slash scale. You'll even get the deck, this large, huge deck. It's a living document that we're working on in Google Slides um, to help our founders and all founders out there who are trying to start companies know the basics about how to get your little MVP, your prototype to scale, to get escape velocity, to get to the point where it's a real business that could have $100 million in revenue and go public someday. That's what we're looking to do here. We're looking to do big ideas, big companies that can change the world. That doesn't mean that they have to succeed. In fact, our business is having one in 30 become a unicorn. Maybe nine out of the 30 have a good return and 20 of the 30 just to go up and smoke, to blow up on the launch pad, to just spiral out of control and just blow up. No risk, no reward. That's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to take risks and the better the idea, sometimes the smaller the chance of success. And that's what we're in it for. We're here for that, as the kids are saying these days. Um, we've done nine episodes. The first one was funding your company. We did an episode on communications. Then we went on to business models. We talked about team. We talked about sales. We talked about in episode six, staying lean, which is critically important because the leaner you are, the more optionality you have, the more runway you have, the more time you can spend with your customers learning. Then we got into fundraising again diving into the finer details in episode seven at your request because you said, hey, that's not even enough. an hour and 20 minutes of fundraising in episode one wasn't enough. And then in episode eight, we talked about marketing. Episode nine, we talked about delighting customers because that's super important. And now we're going to talk about culture in episode 10. And with me is Ashley Whitehurst. She is the managing director of the syndicate and Jackie Deegan, who is the managing director of education here at launch. Welcome back to the program, Ashley and Jackie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We've got a lot to get through today. So let's go to our first slide here. Remember, 90% of people are listening. So we got a sportscast what's on the slide, but let's get right into it. So we're going to start with creating your culture. It's, it's something that has to be started on day one. This is one of those things where an absence of a decision still yields a result. Ah. So it, that result will be a culture of ambivalence. Yeah. And so it's... You, and, this is a bit theoretical. So culture really is, there's a lot of definitions for it, but it really is the personality and sort of moral code of the company. Hmm. And so as a, a founder can think of it as, you know, who do I want to work with? Hmm. Who have I worked with in the past that's been really terrific? And how do I foster that environment that will attract those employees, attract that team, and help me, help me you know, solve my mission? You know, Got help it. Me get towards that. I liked what you said about not making a decision results in a decision. Yes. And the decision could be ambivalence, like nobody cares about the culture, or worse, a hijacked culture where some element in the company decides this is our culture and they spread it without you knowing it. So be very careful there. Um, right. Okay. And it's also it's also much easier to create a standard to to work from as opposed to in flight trying to change things when it comes to it's, yeah. it's, it's tough to correct culture sure yeah culture. if you're if you want to work on the engines you better do that when the plane's on the ground exactly yeah and then actually it's an interesting analogy because if you do need to reset the culture you might need to land the plane to do it yeah. and land and take somebody off the plane add people onto the plane and have a discussion on the ground because doing it at thirty thousand feet is not going to be pleasant yes yeah 
It happens. It's not pleasant. Uh, we see it happen all the time. I've had it happen inside of companies. Uh, okay. So the first the first step in that is knowing your mission. Mm-hmm. Have a very firm mission at launch. It's supporting founders and inspiring innovation. Yeah. Everything we do services that mission. And just, is that mission still accurate for us? Because we've had that mission now for, I think, seven years. You've been here for five of those, I think. Do you feel like, in all candidness, that that accurate rep- accurately represents us in 2019? And does it actually help when we're thinking about our decisions? I would say yes and yes. (laughs) And you're not just saying that because I'm the boss and I came up with it. it. It actually does create a really good lens. Are we supporting founders? Right. That's our customer, basically. Yeah, the founders are our customers, they're yeah. our partners, right. and we, we can only do as well as they do. Right. Mm-hmm. We're tied at the hip to them. If they succeed, we succeed. If they fail, we fail. And do you guys, can you guys each think of a situation where you had to make a decision and that lens, especially the first part, supporting founders, mm-hmm. helped? Yeah, I think for me, um, I sort of in my dual role as like producer and managing director of education, uh, when I'm coordinating an event, um, as a producer, sometimes, you know, people ask about like speaking fees and they want all this extra stuff. And then as the other part of supporting founders, I have to like, it's really about the founders and their experience and bringing value to them. It's not about paying a lot of money to a big name who just wants to, for an ego ride. So yeah. it's a very easy, like in the beginning, it was a little more uncomfortable, you know, because mm-hmm. I understand people get paid for this sort of a weird example. Sorry, but no, but it's like I really think it's helpful. a perfect it's example. Like, we're here to give founders value, and that's our our biggest goal. That's our, our mission. That's our mission. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody were to call, because listen, I get paid speaking fees when I go places, and I do it typically for two reasons. Like, one, it's an extraordinary amount of money, and I have no choice but to take it. Or two, <laughs> I want to go to that you know, country or city and hang out there. Um, and then the third reason I'll do a speaking gig is because I think it forces our mission here. Yeah. Right. And when, when it's like, you know, and is it supporting founders and inspiring innovation? Yeah, that maybe I'll go do that. You know, I'll go to Stockholm and, and support Tyler and yeah, that'll support founders. And then the second part of the mission, inspiring innovation, that also is a pretty good lens too, because when we do our events and people come and they see other founders there, It inspires them to innovate. So I consider that one. The reason I added it to our mission was, you know, a lot of people come and they don't have a startup yet, right? And I personally believe that inspiring people to innovate will result in them using a startup as the format. Um, And it also will solve some of society's big problems. If people feel like, and I think it's a really acute problem in society right now, where people actually feel like maybe it's better to harangue the government to give me more free stuff than for me to go start something. Mm. And I really want to kind of correct that in the world, that people think, you know what, maybe I can start a company and solve a big problem in the world while taking care of my family and my team and myself. Yeah. Uh, okay, so knowing your mission is important, being intentional and immediate, we got that. Now, what's the third one here? So in order to service your mission, you need to set core values on how you're going to hold yourself accountable, mm. your team accountable, how, um, you know, what your moral code is, what... Um, mm you know, what your intentions are. Yeah. It's being intentional. Yeah. And, and you know, it's mixed on how many core values is really the right number. It, most companies have anywhere from three to 10. Some founders will say no more than three. You want your core values to be something that every employee that works for you knows and remembers. Yeah. They can remember three things. Can they remember 10? I don't know. But Netflix has 10 and they've got pretty great company culture. So yeah. it's not... Um, it's it's up to the founder, but mm. I think between three and ten is probably the right. If you're if you're in you know twenty core values, you're probably you know jumping the shark a bit. Yeah, you're picking everything. Yeah, <laughs> you're picking. that's like going on the menu, and they're like, "What would you like for your starter?" And you're like, "Yes, everything." Yes. <laughs> which you, like you do sometimes. Right. Which I have done. Yeah, you've been it's like you've been out to eat with me for uh-huh. like, cultural equivalent. Now we never did much. that here. I I think we may have uh, five mm-hmm. years ago. I just don't remember. But I've never really focused on that because it seemed very apparent to me, and we're a small company, but maybe we should. Founders use millions of tools to become more efficient, to be more crisp, to be more on their game. Well, here's the most important tool you need. It's called sleep. And I have been getting amazing sleep these days because I have an eight sleep bed. What is an eight sleep bed? It is the first intelligent bed that's ever existed in the world. It monitors your sleep and it tells you how you're sleeping. Deep sleep, light sleep, and you get a sleep score every day. And if you can measure it, as you know, you can manage it. 
And the best feature, you put on your eight sleep bed and then it creates two zones, one for you and one for your partner. And you can set and dial the temperature and you can coordinate the temperature over time during your sleep. So I know myself, I'm a guy, I get hot. I need a nice cold, crisp bed with those perfect sheets, but nice and cool. You know when you get in that bed and it's nice and cool and you go to bed so easy? That's what's happening. And then I make it even a little bit colder to increase my blood pressure and my temperature when I wake up. And you can set that all in this beautiful app. It will make your mood better. It will make your decision making better. Just go look up the value of sleep. You've heard all these experts talk about unlocking your sleep. And that is a superpower. The thermal alarm is amazing, wakes you up naturally, and I'm seeing the results. So it's time for you to supercharge your health and productivity, just like I'm doing. Get the sleep you need and deserve by heading to 8sleep.com slash twist. That's 8sleep, E-I-G-H-T, sleep.com slash twist. And you can try the product risk-free for 100 days. Imagine that. That's how you know how confident somebody is with their product, how easy it is to return if you don't like it. I will never, ever have a bed that is not an eight sleep bed. I am not kidding you. It's the Tesla. It's the Fitbit. It's the uh, greatest product I've ever had in terms of sleeping. It's amazing. You know, I pair it with a little bit of the calm meditation as well. So my sleep is on point. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Yeah. And I've thought about it a bit about yeah. what our core values are. And I think they're, I think if we were all to sit down the same sort of three to five would yeah, come yeah, up between, uh, you know, amongst the team. All right, you guys tell me. What do you think? Then? <laughs> Let's do it right now. Um, That's I maybe would... interesting. What's on the top? We'll, we'll do a round robin. You do one. Jackie does one. I do one. So we I... like fa- it's this is sort of like Family Feud. Yeah, survey I, says I would say one of our co- core values is GSD. <laughs> getting sure. stuff done. For sure. Yeah, stuff done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, getting get, getting that ish yeah. done. We we do have that like efficiency just get stuff done, Mm -hmm. which I always say the term do the work, (laughs) Yep. um, which I guess could be a separate core value or is sort of the other side of that coin, which is we really want people who do the work Mm -hmm. as opposed to people who talk about doing the work. There's really, and we've had people on the team who are talkers who don't GSD and man, it's just obvious. Like we're all just getting through hundreds of emails and calls and documents. When somebody doesn't put in the effort we put in, it just becomes super apparent. And it, it, that's kind of an interesting thing about our culture is that, that was, was that on the top of your list too, Jackie? It was, yeah. I would also say resilience. And um, ah. I do think collaboration as well. Mm-hmm. I, would, yeah. I would add collaboration. I had do the work as my number one. So I think we were all on there. I also put ownership. Um, as my mm. number two, and I really didn't just give it that. I just wrote down a couple, but I really feel like we have a culture of owning stuff um, where if you say you're going to do something, you do it, right? Like it's just, and candidness, mm-hmm. which, you know, a lot of this stuff is top down. You know, leaders pick the people they want to work with. I think you said that in your first line, like you're going to hire sometimes your friends or people you want to work with. Everybody here has self selected for people who are hardworking, who take ownership, who are resilient and resourceful. And yeah, resourceful, resourceful is a resourceful. really good one. Yeah, we are super clever and resourceful here. Yeah, we don't like, have time for people saying, but I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. Right. I don't, I've never done that before. It's just like, can you or imagine I was waiting for someone to tell me what to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah, all of those are really bad. Like literally in my younger years, people was, when I was a maniac, which you guys know, I'm no longer a maniac. Yeah, no. Nope. Mm-hmm. Not at all. Never wow, you guys bit. seem like you have Stockholm <laughs> syndrome right now. <laughs> Never. Never. No. You are just right. Spit Literally, it out on like, this. <laughs> I had somebody in the East look at our poor days tell me they didn't know how to do something. I was like, oh, you don't know how to do something? Oh. Really? Let me Google okay, that for hold you. Hold on one second. I literally <laughs> took my laptop in the middle of the meeting. And I was like, how do... <laughs> and I edited this person. like, I get it. I was like, oh, no. You, this is going to go off for five more minutes. I'm going to just drag it out. Um, but resiliency... And I also put integrity here. I think we talk about this a lot internally. Um, and I don't know if integrity is the right word, but we really talk about like, hey, if we're going to do stuff, let's do it right. Yeah. And I think the manifestation for that would be, we were just talking about like, hey, when do we wire? When do we wire the money when we make an investment? When we decide to make an investment in a company. We wire the money. The same day we sign the documents. Correct. As quick as humanly possible. 
because we want our fa- we've been I've been on the other side and we've seen other investors drag their feet they've signed the documents or they made the commitment and they didn't wire it if you make the commitment and you're going to send the money anyway why would you drag your feet right that makes no sense to me and i see it all the time where my founders our founders are chasing checks and it makes no sense to me fun quickly you've made the decision already so it's high standards too i mean it's like there's a high standard that. here yeah high, um yep. i think it's also important i mean everything we've mentioned you could sort of put that into other people's culture, right? But but not every company operates like we do. Like I saw several companies where one of their core values was humility. I would not say I'm that sorry, that's what? I would say that's I would say that's not one of our <laughs> core values. No, it's, we're not trying to be humble. We're trying to be over perform. We're trying to overperform and we're trying to right. punch above our weight is something I say all the time. It's mm-hmm. like we're a 15 person company. That's a good one. And people when we were a five person company, 10 person company, they always said it was like how, how do you get all this done with five or 10 or 15 people? And it's like, well, we get it all done because we have the right five, 10 or 15 people. And if mm-hmm. you're resourceful, yeah. And if you GSD, it's going to get done. But yeah, humility is. Well, and I didn't say that so that you could, you know. It's not a personal jab. Yes. I vomit it. on it. But, but yeah. and there just are that, moments to be humble. But, oh, but yeah. that's just, that's when you have to decide as the founder, is this a core value? Is being, is being you know, having humility, being humble, something that we care a lot about and is, you know, part of our culture? No. But for no. another company, it could be very important. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, if, I w- if you were to tell me how important is humility to you, I would say in what we do, the act of being an investor is humbling at its core mm-hmm. because the first two or three years of investing, you literally get your ass kicked no matter who you are and how good you are. I mean, I hit three unicorns in the first seven, but- Nobody's counting. Nobody's counting. <laughs> uh, and the first syndicate was Khan, which was unicorn too, but nobody's counting. Mm-mm. You're likely to get your ass kicked in those first couple of years. So you, the humility comes when you yeah, think that you made in. the right decision. It's built in. Yeah. And it, instead of being humble as an investor, what I would tell people is to be resilient and consistent and just put the work in. That's why I just say with people who are getting into investing, just do the work. Yeah. Put the work in because that's the one thing you have control over is how hard you work. You actually don't have control over if this idea is going to work or not because you you have customers. You, you're putting an idea into the world. There's a complex system where all the startups we invest in have to deploy their products called humanity. Mm-hmm. And humanity is going to do what they want with your idea. They may use it for something you haven't decided. And Well, yeah, that's a, that's a bad one. Hum- humility would be on the not even on my radar. No, we know that. Yeah. <laughs> so once you have all your core values and you yes. understand who your company is, yeah. then you can start hiring. Yeah, which makes sense. Which, Here we go. Slide which, number two. Which uh, Jeff okay. will talk about. All right, great. Thanks, so, okay, so you've established the mission and culture. Um, Ashley was talking about, great. So now you need the team, right, the people to bring it to life and to scale it. So how do you find these people? Um, so obviously when you're hiring, you're looking at uh, – Relevant experience skills, hard skills, programming, video, soft skills, like the uh, communication, creativity, EQ, all that stuff is important. But you also want to try to match for a culture fit. And regardless of what their actual role is or what their skills are or anything else or their job titles. So how do you how do you do this? How do you find a culture fit? So there are a few approaches. Um, one is public facing. So this is, I, this is actually my term. Um, so be super clear about your values, first of all. Yeah. Um, once you've done the work of defining them, don't hide them, tell the world. One way to do this is to just have it on your website, right? Yeah. Just a bit listing them and keep it updated. Just like what we did. We should just yeah. go put it on our website. Transparency. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and some of them, are great. there's some great examples. Atlassian has an open company, no bullshit, build with heart and balance, don't the is customer, no bullshit really one of their core values? Of the, yep. Play oh as a team. I saw that a lot. Be the change you seek. Uh, Squarespace also, they have them. Design is not a luxury. Empower inv- individuals. And they keep them up to date. It's great. So um, the next thing you should do is to um, use language and refer to your values in any job posting that you do. Right. I was about um, to add that one. It's yeah, so yeah. critical because Just, if you read it in a job post yeah. and it doesn't vibe with you, you're like, well, I'm not going to go there. Yeah. But if you're like, oh, namaste, to... humility and life work balance. And, <laughs> no yeah, I'll go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you just want to make sure you're communicating your culture in the job yeah. ad so that the right candidates will find you. Mm. So uh, another approach is candidate facing, um, basically in interviews. So you want to ask questions that yeah. um, relate directly to your values. You know, what do you value most about work? What type of team do you thrive in? Give us examples of how you went out of your way 
to for a customer, but you have to really be honest with yourself as to whether they're a fit. Like if your core value is collaboration and they keep bringing up that they're a rene renegade, you know, you kind of want to be careful about that. So uh, team facing. Um, when your team interviews a candidate, one idea is to really is to create a, an actual scorecard, and this is a little mm. more quantitative um, scorecard based on your principles. And the interviewing team has to score the candidate based on how well they do. So to do that, you have to actually list the attributes and their score on the scorecard, um, and then just have them score as they go. So. If you're doing it this way, then the questions really can't be open-ended. You have to attach a score to it, right? Mm. So it has to be sort of either or, like which describes you better, consulting with others before you make a decision or acting out on your own, and then kind of assign mm. points based on each one. That's um, and this yeah. is a way to really kind of prevent bias too, because you know if it's a metric that's not tied to any other thing that could be suspect, it's mm. really like it's tied to the things that you care about in your culture, and that's what the score is. Yeah, the way I do that in our whenever I'm involved in the hiring process at launch is I just say to people, you know, you met Ashley, Jackie, DeMont, Sam, whoever in the company. They're very hardworking. Oh, I asked them, what did you think? And they're like, yeah, they're impressive or whatever. And I say, great. You know, people here are very hardworking. And if, and they also take ownership of things and they get a lot done. Uh, if you don't and you, you're not that type of person who likes to take ownership, it becomes really apparent really quick. So you should really know that about coming in here is that you're going to be running with a pe group of people who run like a seven-minute mile. They're not jogging. They're running. Mm -hmm. And if you want to jog or you want to go for a hike, that's different. We're running here. We're running right. uh, because we like to run. We like the feeling. Uh, and I think, what do you guys do when we're interviewing to try to suss this out? Because we don't get it perfect. No. Um, and we've sometimes had people who... We think are going to GSD. We think they're going to work hard. And then we're like, hmm, not working as hard as we thought they would. Look at it on paper. Look at it in interviews. Actually, and I usually get it perfect. You yeah. do. Yeah. Actually, I you think... guys have a better track record than me. We do. <laughs> actually, I think that's one of my superpowers. I know. Just I knowing. Can't... Just knowing. Just... Yeah. I've, I think I have. A, and you share it. I think we have spidey senses. Yeah. And also, we've been working together. So I think we know exactly what it takes to work here. <laughs> and, you know, we, we yeah. can naturally screen for it. I think. Yeah, you can tell by when someone's just telling you something you want to hear. Ah. Yeah, for sure. That's a good one. And when you ask them about situations, you give them situational questions. Oh, how really? do you, yeah, how, what, you know, talk to me about a time you felt extreme stress and yeah. how do you get through it? And, right. And when they're like, oh, well, I don't really feel stress. And if I do, I just write a little to do list and then I'm good. You're like, yeah. liar. Yeah. <laughs> or asking the yeah. why question, you know, why do you want this job? And you yep. can kind of hear if they're faking it or they really care about this. Yeah. The, why would you want to be here is, I think, a big question. Yeah. Like, it is, and, and as we've gotten more, you know, like maybe five or 10 years ago, we didn't have our pick of the litter as it was, but then we've been very successful the last couple of years. We do have our pick of the litter. And so, and we do pay much better salaries now and have, you know, upside in the funds and that kind of stuff. So we can be a little bit more demanding about it and, yeah. and expect more from people. Right. Um, and there's like, a reason for them to want to be here. Um, but if you don't love startups and you don't love innovation, man, the pressure we're under sometimes is intense. Like if a founder is failing, like being able to tell a founder you're not going to do a bridge funding, like that is not my favorite thing to do. We're dealing with like founders who or other VC firms that want to screw you over. Yeah. I mean, it's, they can be high-pressure situations, just not as high-pressure as being at one of the companies we invest in right. where the clock is ticking for when they run out of money. I think it's important, too, to just point out that, you know, when Jackie's talking about these <clears throat> great ways of hiring and, and finding culture fit, not one of them said, you know, like – looks like me, is from the same neighborhood as me, yeah. from, you know, you're basing yeah. these, you know, you're basing these on um, on your core values, on, yeah. you know, your, your forward-facing values. Yeah. You already know Zendesk. It is the world's best customer support system. But what you may not yet know is that they have an entire range of products called the Zendesk Suite. And here it is. If you're watching, go to Zendesk.com slash twist and you can sign up that fast. Boom. And you will get integrated customer support. This lets you track and prioritize and solve customer tickets, i.e. complaints, i.e. problems 
across all of your different channels in one seamless dashboard. Some people want to text, some people want to use chat, some people want to use email, some people want to use web forms, whatever it is, you're going to get all of this organized and you're going to be able to prioritize it and make sure that you leave no customer behind because a pissed off customer is a disaster. Zendesk lets you avoid those and turn those detractors into people who are advocates. Well, Zendesk is going to get you that save with the Zendesk guide. It's a knowledge base for your customers to look for solutions to common problems. The live chat, of course, all these millennials and Gen Z, they don't want to pick up the phone. They want to just do a quick chat and solve their problems. And with all your support channels connected, agents will be more productive and you're going to save money and you don't have to add so many agents and throw bodies at it. You're going to throw technology and enterprise software at it. And it's all flat rate pricing and it's very startup friendly. I want you to go right now and get this amazing offer. And I cannot believe that this offer exists. Zendesk is giving qualified startups defined by series B or below or under 100 employees, which I think is a pretty good definition of startups. I might use that myself. You can join the startup program and get Zendesk products for free. Zero, nothing, nada for a full year. Can you imagine how gracious that is of them to give my startups a free year? It's the most generous offer I think I've ever read an ad for. Zendesk.com slash twist to get it for free for a year if you are in fact a startup. And if you're listening to this week in startups, pretty good chance you're a startup. Okay, speaking of this week in startups, let's get back to this amazing episode. Right. I mean, that's a good segue, Ashley. Um, so on to diversity, inclusion, and non-harassment. So um, in addition to the other culture values that we just talked about, which are very company specific, like get you done or transparency or radical candor or, yeah. whatever, or anything else that are vary from company to company, there are some things that are important too and really should be adopted in every company culture. Yeah. <laughs> um, so diversity... Number one, um, you know, going to state what I hope is obvious, but your team should be diverse and your cu culture should reflect that. Why? And well, um, one from just sort of a human perspective, being inclusive, reflecting, reflecting diverse, diversity in our society and, and our customers. Yeah. Um, but from also a business standpoint, there's a lot of research around this, too. Diversity is really important to stay competitive, attract great talent and be profitable. Um, I, I think, yeah, just pausing for a moment there. Just think about just gender differences. We've had a number of female, we, we have seen a massive spike in the number of female founders we fund through a couple of different efforts. Maybe you could each unpack maybe why you think that is. I think that there's two things. I think that in general, society has gotten better at this and Silicon Valley as a result. Yeah. I do think that we have become a lot more intentional about it okay. in our events and creating special products like Founder University for female founders or for underrepresented founders. Yeah. So we've really sort of taken it on as a thing that we want to see in the world. And people who identify as female. Correct. Because uh, we've had the trans uh, gender community mm -hmm. yep. uh, attending the female founder yeah. university. We ask now. people if, if you self identify as any of these. Yeah. And that really has made a dramatic change. It really has. Also, I, I have to think, and I don't know this because uh, I've never asked, but if you come to our accelerator interviews and it was just me and DeMont, two white guys, people might think one thing, but if they met you and Ashley and Sam, they might think another thing, mm -hmm. uh, which is good. Yeah, and they get to also meet our alumni who are, and they're also diverse. Yeah. Like Explain section. to me what the difference between diversity and inclusion is. Well, inclusion... Or is that just a pair of words that just go together normally? Yeah, they do go together normally. I yeah. think that you can talk about um, inclusion, I think, is more of a mindset, too, ah. in addition to practice. You know, it's like you're you're celebrating other cultures and celebrating other races and ethnicities yeah. and genders. So it's... So including, yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought when, you, when we said it in this context, my mind went to including diverse people in the important decisions. Yes, and that's coming. Oh, good. Okay, excellent. <laughs> yes. Um, um, should I keep going? Yeah, please. Okay, great. So um, I just wanted to kind of highlight the point that I made before uh, about the research. Uh, there was a recent, uh, even from 2018, there was research from McKinsey that found a statistically significant correlation between diverse leadership and better financial performance. Um, so companies in the top quartile for ethnic diversity at the executive level are 33% more likely to have above average profitability. 
profitability than companies in the bottom quartile. Same with gender diversity, although that's 21% instead of 33%. Um, Do you know if that's correlation or causation? I wonder if the companies that are successful are just better executing on the recruitment and the people who are less successful are less considered and do a bad job on recruiting. Yeah, it's probably all of those things. It's probably all of those things, yeah. yeah. I think they, they use specifically correlation and not causation because I don't, I don't think they know. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, but it's, the good news is we're having that discussion yeah, right now, exactly. right? It does seem to me anecdotally that when we're looking at a company that is a product that I'm not going to use, like panty prop or something like that, that I, you know, it's not in my wheelhouse exactly, um, we can make a better decision on things that, uh, a female might buy than a male, right? Yeah, right? And so I feel like a lot of our blind spots or my blind spots are going to be solved by the team we have here. So, And in addition to diversity in just makeup and, and uh, background, uh, diversity in thought is also really important. Mm -hmm. um, Beth Shear from Homebrew, uh, she's a head of talent. She's given this great talk at our founding university a couple times. She talks about this, the people like us syndrome. That's mm -hmm. sort of what you were talking about. It's like you want to avoid the people like us syndrome. Yeah. And we know that that goes on a lot here in Silicon yeah. Valley and every uh, places. You know, you can see investment firms and startups even on their team pages, right? Um, and it's a little bit of a human... I don't know. It's, it's There's something human about it, too, because uh, there was a recent study from the Kellogg School that found that managers want recruits that have the potential to be friends. So there's a little bit of that built, baked into human tendency, I think. So you have to counteract it is sort of yeah. the bottom line. Like well, you have in to fact, be intentional. we just said in the first slide that you want to hire for culture. And if the people who made the culture are three white dudes or three women or three Asian mm -hmm. men or yeah. three Indian women, whatever it happens to be, well, they... That might be something that you just baked into the culture that then causes hiring to be harder because you're scoring them on culture and maybe you put yeah. bias into the culture. So yeah. you ha and this is a very complex issue that I don't think yeah. anybody's mastered yet. Yeah. So I think actually maybe I'm just having a little real realization here that I wonder if when you're creating those values, if you have to be cognizant of what downstream second order you know, impact it can have, yeah. right? There could be some second order problem or challenge that is because you picked values. I remember Uber had be pumped at all times or something it was like one of them. <laughs> and Travis and I are friends for a long time. Like his enthusiasm is like huge. Yeah. But there might be people who are introverts who get pumped and, you know, want to be yeah. samurais or, you know, it used to be a big problem. Whenever you would put a developer, you'd say, I'm looking for a ninja. You know, I'm looking for a right. warrior. Right. I'm looking, and I, you know, I'm guilty of this too because you know, got Seven Samurai as my favorite film or whatever. You know, like I'm always talking about samurai sort of ethic, work ethic, and you know, whatever. Um, you you might actually, women might not apply to a place that they think is going to be a war zone. Yeah, you may just be signaling I don't want to, or, or you may in, maybe other groups. So you have to be very careful uh, about the language you use. So exactly. I mean, I, I think it just you need to be intentional about it. Have the conversation. Um, one, a few suggestions for doing this when you're ex you're, ex you're expanding your hire hiring yeah. pool. I know we already talked about hiring, but expand the pool. Do some outreach. Uh, find organizations who have diverse members or colleges with diverse alumni. Um, make sure you're crafting unbiased job descriptions, mm. kind of like what you're talking about. Textio, which we're going to talk about later, is a great tool for that. If you're saying ninja or, you know, this figures out what your biases are when you're yeah. posting descriptions. And unintended in most cases, I would think. Yeah. So it's a good way to, so you just want to be, and then there are other things. They have blind uh, recruitment software, which removes personal and democratic uh, demographic information for the candidate's application, like age, gender, race, ethnicity. Um, and I think there's sort of a caveat with that, because I think if you're intentionally trying to hire for diversity, that's obviously not a perfect solution. And there are other solutions for that. And it's an evolving field, but for example, we had a uh, founder on the show, Laura Gomez from uh, Tipica. They do a comprehensive tool. It's an AI talent platform that helps you actually find diverse talent and meet your inclusion goals. Yeah. So there's there's a, there's a number of approaches. It's just you just need to the be most interesting about it. Yeah. The most interesting one I saw was the Vox Media, my friend Jim Bankoff's company, had a walkout uh, by the journalists, and they were unionizing. Which my first reaction to it was like, really? Like, you're starting a union on the Titanic? 
Like <laughs> it's like literally the media business is crashing and burning. And like Gawker did it, a whole big union thing right before they imploded. And I'm like, wow, they're literally fighting over like the scraps that are left. Yeah. Um, and I just, and it was like, we, we've now made the base pay 48,000 or something. It was like, okay, okay congratulations. Like th this business is really challenged. The one thing I thought that was very cool was that part of what they were fighting for was not about money or job security. They wanted inclusion as a big part of it. They said for every pos every senior position, because the senior positions weren't diverse enough, I think, f f to their own admission, they were working on it. They wanted to see at least half the final candidates or the in-person candidates be diverse. And I thought, well, that's interesting. It's Because then you can't rely on like, well, listen, we got 100 resumes yeah. and... You know, there were only X number of these people and Y no, and only 14 women applied and all of them didn't have master's degrees. So we eliminated them. Yeah. They're like, no, you have to get two women out of the, you know, four final candidates or whatever it happens to be. Yeah. Uh, and, and beyond that, even beyond the hiring piece, you know, you have to just look at your practices and make sure that you're you're maintaining dedication to inclusion in like promotion, compensation. Um, that's one way to. Uh, not only attract but retain diverse talent, um, maybe offer mentoring, training. Just You have to just be really intentional and dedicated to yeah, it. For sure. um, it's hard work. Yeah. Um, very important, though. So quick non-harassment policy. Uh, very clear. Be super clear about what is tolerated and what is not tolerated. Put your harassment policy on your website. Link to it whenever possible and appropriate. Maintain I can't believe we have to talk about this in 2019. Tolerant culture. I know. It's pretty clear. But You'd be surprised. Um, no, we wouldn't be surprised because we run events with yeah, thousands and we of people. Yeah, have to remind them. people all the time. We, what do you do now? You, we used to have the form. We used to have a, a page. Here's our non-harassment pass we do. on we the website. It. Yep. But I just noticed on one of the type forms, are we making people check the non-harassment policy now that they understood and read it? They have to check the box that they understood and read it. We give Who came up with it. that idea? Was that yours? I think it was yours. I, I don't remember. I mean, kudos to whoever came up with that <laughs> I think idea. It was yours. Yeah. I know no. I implemented it the first time we did it, but I'm fairly certain it was not. It was a very idea. good idea because, was, like, was, putting the know. harassment policy on the website is sort of like, well, we're just doing a CYA for ourselves. Sometimes we'll just do it in the actual email, too. We, we did we, do that before we did that. We yeah. did. Yeah, but making people check it was because we had somebody do something stupid at an event. Yeah, we've had that yeah. a couple of times. That's, ha that's happened a couple of times. Yeah. Because we have tens of thousands of people over the last yeah. five years come yeah. to events. Uh, okay. um, so, yeah, so this should be adopted by everyone. Um, and, you know, some things will vary, like consensual activity, like dating, for example. I mean, that's a different thing that should be dealt with differently. Like, and that's part of the culture. That's how you define like coworker dating is not the same as harassment because it's, it's not, I mean, it's consensual, right? Sure. But might be it discouraged be in your culture. Yeah. So that's a culture thing. But this should be just standard practice. I just saw a, a chart where they said, how did you meet your spouse? And... In the 90s, it peaked at like 30% of people met their spouse at work, and then it plummets. <laughs> and then right. you see this red line, online. So now everybody's yeah. just meeting them online yeah. and at bars, yeah. which I think are correlated. Like, okay, if you're dating nowadays, like you're using Tinder or whatever, you're meeting somebody, you go for a drink. Yeah. And work went down to like 15%. It yeah. literally got cut in half in the <laughs> last. Thank the Lord. <laughs> and in these cases, coworkers dating is one thing. But from what I understand... The, you don't even have to report coworkers dating, but you just ha you do have to report and talk to your HR person about superior. your superior, yeah, uh, your, your direct totally. report, yeah. And then the company can take you out of yep. that reporting relationship. And if there is no way to do that, then one of you has to decide to leave. So talk about messy. Yeah. If you're a small twenty person company and there's like one engineering department with six people, and you report into the CTO or you're in sales and you report into the VP of sales, like. Yeah. Well, either you're going or she's going, you that's know, right. like right because there's, he a, or there's she a power or he dynamic he. there that's yeah kind of not non consensual. Okay, yeah, I think another one that's oh. worth I think talking about in this culture uh, on that slide is maintain high integrity at, in the management. If whatever the management does, I find people take it twice as far, or somebody will. And so I just remember at some point there was some pop culture thing. Oh, I know. It's the fire festival. There were like a couple of funny scenes in the fire festival that were graphic, let's say. Mm -hmm. Not pornographic, but graphic. And somebody posted it into like the Slack because it was funny and it was related to startups. And I was like, yeah, one time, let's not post it again. <laughs> because this is the thing. I think Slack is a really um, – at any chat software or any online software, people seem to get looser 
mm-hmm. because it feels like a looser communication method. And then everybody's on it, so you're broadcasting. So you don't even have the ability, like, I said something inappropriate, and you can look people in the eye and be like, oh, you were offended, weren't you? I'm sorry. So somebody says something in a chat room, three people are offended in the, of the 30, and you don't even know it. Yeah, that's interesting. So if you're the leader of the company, don't make any inappropriate jokes. And if somebody makes an inappropriate joke, or there is a sexual innuendo that drops, you have to squash it. Mm-hmm. And just say, hey, let's tone that down. Let's move on. You probably heard me say that a couple yeah. times where... And then you know my rule about drinking. Like if we're working and we host a lot of events, like you know, one glass of wine or no glass of wine, don't drink at our events. Yeah. Friday night when the event's over, you guys can go out drinking. But the drinking culture in Silicon Valley, I think, caused a lot of problems, yeah. uh, candidly. Like okay. the partying culture, just like leave Burning Man at Burning Man. And, right. You know. Get back to work. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, okay, high performance. Here we go. Speaking yeah, so <laughs> culture culture should be part of everything that you do. It's mm. It sort of weaves its way through every aspect of the business from, you know, customer interactions to hiring to meetings to your performance as a team. Um, and so one of the, you know, the first thing is, you know, bringing in the review cycle. So setting a review cycle for your high performance. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we talk about this in that we're not looking, we're not talking about companies that want to have slow growth with low performance. So we're assuming everyone wants a high performance culture. Um, but if you're a startup, yeah. you want a high performance yeah. culture so, because you have jet fuel behind you. Right. And and setting your review cycle, it's it's really easy to just say we do reviews once a year. Yeah. That's a really easy go to. You don't have to think about it. It's how everybody else does it, you know. Um, it's the expectation. But it can be for a high performance culture, it it can be really discouraging and demotivating because after a year's time and Patty McCord talks about this she was on the show after a year's time you're talking about the last 12 months so yeah. something that you know was an issue 6 months ago and yeah. is no longer a problem you're you're bringing it back up when yeah. it's already been corrected and it it feels sort of like a silly process that was a great guest and a great book by the yeah. way it's a very short read but Patty yes. McCord was amazing yeah, if you was. haven't seen that episode I wow. stand Patty McCord What's that? I stand Patty McCord. What does it mean? I stand. <laughs> it means I'm a fan. Oh, I'm. I'm. I'm sorry. I have never I don't know heard of that. I don't know either. <laughs> yeah, I stand. If Nick were Are here, you there he for would, it? He. I'm there for it. I'm, I'm there, there for her. I'm so there. I'm for there. Patty. I'm there for Patty McCord. I'm so there for Patty McCord. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here I'm there for you. Being there. For preach. Patty um. So it's you know adults so, only. So maybe maybe doing a you know, setting a, a quarterly yeah. review cycle or a weekly. I mean, there are tools out there that allow you to just d- give quick quick feedback. Yeah. Um, and we'll talk about tools a little bit later. But setting a review cycle that works for your high-performance culture. Yeah. Most most high performers want some goals to hit and yeah. then you let them run. Yep. And so bothering them every week or only doing it once a year is probably, you probably have to find some right balance between the two. The better job you do at hiring and the better job you do at setting your culture the easier it is to manage that process. Yes. Here, the senior manager send me an EOW. So it's Friday. You guys will send me your EOWs probably at 9 o'clock tonight, but maybe before or sometimes on Saturday. And then everybody else who's not on the senior management team does EODs. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people miss them. It's not the end of the world. But boy, that became what a great forcing function. Some people didn't ever send their EODs in and were like, well, you obviously don't want the job here if you can't write five-minute bullet, three bullet points of what you accomplished today. And it's also good for, I mean, when you look at a review, if you're doing a review on a monthly basis, you look back at those reports and say, this is what got done. This is what, you know, and and you also have receipts. If you responded to that email and said, hey, let's work on this next week or let's do this. Yeah, I got receipts. You've got, yeah. You got all the terms today, man. You're dropping receipts and you're there for it. You stand, I stand for it. I'm a really cool person. You are very cool. (laughs) 15.5, by the way, one of our investments, 15five.com is worth taking a look at. Because they do this on a weekly basis. You ask three questions. You can change it to each of your employees. And the direct manager then will highlight things they answered to their manager. So you can kind of roll up. Mm -hmm. So if we were, let's say we were a 150-person company and four of you who are in the leadership positions had 40 people each working for you, you could highlight 10 things a week. And I would see the of your 40 people's three answers, 120 answers, you might show me five that are indicative or important or things that are blockers or challenges. So when you're really starting to scale and you get past 10 people, check out 15.5. And you can even use it for less than that. It's pretty pretty neat. 
Yeah. So the next thing is for high performance culture, it's really important to include uh, fostering risk taking. So if you foster risk taking, that means that that you appreciate when a team member will have their own idea and take a risk on a project yeah. and they're risking failure also. And mm. so failure can be an option, you know, it can? You, yeah, of course it can. It <laughs> of course can it be. is, yes. Um, it's inherent in what we do. So it's, yeah, it's exactly. So if you if you don't make that a scary proposition, yeah. like you're going to try something new and you might fail, but yeah. you might also might fly. So yeah. let's just try. Let's yeah. just try it. And if you really foster that behavior, people can be autonomous and independent and their ideas matter. And that's really, really important, important mm -hmm. for a high performance culture. Yeah, I think... Uh, taking a risk is important. And as I always tell people, like you, sometimes you just got to make a decision and own it. Mm -hmm. And I think the people who work really good with me make decisions. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Jackie, when you first started working for me, you deferred way too much. And we had that sit down at some point. And I was like, you know what? I want you to pick half the guests this year. And you were like, oh, I kind of like when you pick the guests, maybe I'll pick 10. And then like now, and then I was like, you pick the speakers for the event. Now, this year, I went to Launch Festival Sydney, and I knew the speakers and who was coming when I saw them at dinner. I was like, oh, you're speaking? <laughs> I, I literally don't – I trust you so much with the content that you do 100% of the content. Now, if you were if we were here four years ago, five years ago, I was like, I want this, this, and this, and you bring me things, and we debate it. And now I'm just like, you know what? You're going to do a better job than me. You know what the expectation is because it's a high-expectation culture, and just making a decision – and we had this discussion many times, like, and I, I think it's probably a good moment for us in our working relationship where I said, like, what's the worst that happens if we have a dud every event out of 12 speakers? It's not the end of the world. It's not like the, we had 12 duds. That would be the end of the world. Yeah. But one in 12 or one in eight would be a problem. And then we do rehearsals for every event when we have event <laughs> speakers. So that almost in all cases, if you were going to be a dud, we would know in the rehearsal and more likely you would cancel because you know you're a dud because people are self-aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's also, that's part of the, the wild card, the risk. It's yeah. good. It's good to do this. I want to also just with the setting the review cycle, a power move is to give people preemptive raises. I have done this with both of you more than once where I, before you even had your review, I just said, raise your salary by this amount. Mm -hmm. How did that feel? Uh, well, the first you, time it felt great. The second time I wanted more. Yeah, you didn't get it. I didn't. But I set some goals for you. You did. So we'll and see. And I'm 65% towards that goal. There you go. Keep going. Yep. Keep going. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, if you can pre be preemptive, I, I encourage all founders to think about this. You, giving somebody a 10% raise at month 9, 10, 11 is to me worth more than giving them a 15% raise at the yearly review. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't expect it. It shows appreciation. It shows you are like, you're actually monitoring it. You're watching the work and you're like, yeah, this is high level work. I'm going to do it. We'll uh, talk about rewards a little bit later too as part okay, of the culture. Oh, uh, during the podcast or after? No. <laughs> Both. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, during the podcast. Well, then it's also non-financial rewards, which are super important. I, at yes. one point I realized Jackie loves chocolate and then I've like we'll, literally we'll talk about did the research later. of yeah, like, what is the best chocolate. Later. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, okay, going. so the the last the last bullet point in, in culture and high performance is creating a GSD culture, which is get stuff done. Get that stuff. Get, get that stuff, stuff done. done. Don't step in the stuff. And that just means letting letting people get their work done. Yeah. Don't don't interrupt them mm. with your you know nonsense slack memes. Um, your Dank fire memes. Your, your fire festival <laughs> memes. Um, Lord. And. And really allowing people to set their process. Yeah. High performers want to set their process. Absolutely. They don't want to be bothered. I agree with that. And then I think sometimes high performers um, need to be made aware of new tools. Of course. And so I, I'm not sure how the email sequencing spread in the company like a virus, but somebody did email sequencing. Was it you? Or was um, it a salesperson? No. It, it was, was, it, was, was, it, was it was, no, it? Okay. I, I don't think so. I think it was us. When we did the invites for events, got it. We started. I think that's really where we started with it, and then it went to the accelerator, and then it for went for the guests at the accelerator. Yeah. Yes, and then it went to speakers, right? 
and then it went to podcast. Every, every human yeah, that we interact with at this point. Yeah. 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 Syndicates. Mm-hmm. So well, we, syndicates, not, syndicates not is not quite on it yet. But. Not, yeah. We don't need to because we send one email and we're done. Yes. Yeah, that's a nice feeling. Um, so, yeah, and, and I think that's when – that's a good reason to interrupt a high performer is to say, hey, here's something that'll make you even higher performing. I sure. found something. Yeah. I mean, but collaboration it, could be one of your core values also. So that could be I think, part you of know, that. I'm trying to think about it, but efficiency and tools, there's something there that if we were, we should do a little, the, the Fantastic Four and I should just do a little uh, offsite or something at some point where we just maybe define what the top five are and yeah. just really nail it so yeah. that the, the 16th or 17th a, person gets it. Let's yeah. make that happen. Hey, let's Sam, make that happen. Hey, Sam, make that happen. All right, scaling culture. Are you ready? Yeah. So uh, we pizza. talked about the importance of setting it. Buy pizza. Um, and Cyan Bannister, a Founders Fund, has said this before. She had a great talk at Launch Scale a few years ago. The personality of the company emerges with or without you. Ashley said something like that. Oh. Really can't emphasize that enough. Um, but beyond that and hitting the goals, like how can you ensure that you actually can maintain the culture as you're scaling? Um, if you're going fast, you might think that you just like don't have time to formalize it. And but if you don't, you know, you won't you just won't be able to scale. Yeah. Right. You just won't be able to grow without those core values in place. Um, so I mentioned Cyan and she had a great talk, as I said, and she sort of presented a checklist of tools and values to keep in mind as you scale to really set early and maintain as you grow. So uh, sort of quickly, I'll go through them. Mission, we sort of talked about can't be BS, has to be doable, hard, but achievable. Truth, truth, right? And what this means is sort of trust and integrity. You're leading by example. Like if you're, you don't just say you're a speak up culture and then you're sort of stamping down dissent. If, if, if that's, you know, then it's just not true. Uh, hiring, firing, we talked about that. Uh, we talked about hiring, but firing also. You want to be transparent and consistent so you're not just creating a culture of fear and sort of arbitrariness. Um, yeah, you can't like, be just popping off firing people. That's a really bad look for founders, even yeah. if you're frustrated with people. And, and I think the thing that changed in my mind was I used to think it was my job to take people who were like okay and make them great. And I realized that's like too big of a jump sometimes. You can take good people and make them great or great people and make them exceptional. But unless you've got a psychology degree and you're a professional coach and you have five years and you have hours and hours of experience mentoring people, you're likely not to get a six per level person to a nine level. Yeah. You can get a seven to an eight and an eight to a nine. But you're just not getting a five to a 10. And if you are frustrated by people who perform at a five, six or seven level, which I am, you just can't hire those people. It's just too frustrating. Um, And if you are frustrated, you got to just get them out of there and be, I think there was somebody on the program, Jack will remind me, who said that they were just trying to be as compassionate as possible to a person in that moment. Maybe Phil Libin. Who was it that said that? It was a great line. But they said, listen, you know, if somebody is being fired or whatever, just understand it's like a really, it's a really shitty day for them and like. Yeah. Was it Jerry maybe? I, oh, no. It was probably – maybe it was Jerry Colonna. Who knows? But anyway, uh, just be super kind in that moment and because yeah. it's going to be hard for them. They got, you yeah, know, it's, it can be right. embarrassing to get fired. It can be right. – I mean, who knows? Um, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, direction, vision, ro- roadmap, metrics, um, those are part of the culture too because you want to be setting them and communicating them as yeah. markers as you go. Feedback and communication, you add a culture dimension to that uh, into performance reviews like – Whatever your whatever they are, honesty, courage, dedication to customers, et cetera, add that into the performance review. Hmm. Sort of management structure. Um, Ashley mentioned this a bit. Also, you know, you study. It's not just like a copy and paste thing, but you can study other hmm. like Zappos or Salesforce with their pledge. Um, you can sort of adopt pieces of it, but it's not like a copy paste thing. You have to make it your own. You celebrate, but you also want to implement sort of a kudos system to reward people if they're actually hitting those cultural markers. Um, Or it could be big things or it could be just like office etiquette or meeting etiquette. So and evaluate. You just always want to be evaluating those so that those are some tips for scaling. Yeah. I mean, for me, with the culture here, I decided to try to do this uh, since we started doing Lunch Festival in Sydney. I was like, let's try to make like an epic bucket I just, you know, thinking about millennials, uh, like they got these bucket lists and Instagram. And I was like, well, we that bucket list, too. That's yeah. what they I didn't w- invent the bucket list. Anyway, no. <laughs> millennials with the bucket list and the, and the selfies and the moments and the FOMO. I was like, you know what? Okay, you want FOMO? 
Great, let's dive the Great Barrier Reef. Let's go to the most beautiful beach in the world. Great. And so we did that this year. We went to Hamilton Island. We went to the Wit Sundays and to Whitehaven Beach. Mm -hmm. And That's boy, good. that was like peak experience. In fact, your husband wrote me an incredibly warm note. I don't know if you knew that. He, he gave me a letter to give to you, but I did not know what it said. It said, you're working, <laughs> Ashley, too hard. I'm going to come down there and kick your ass. No, he no, wouldn't. No, he said, he no, never. he was in, we, we, uh, we had spouses come to the Wit Sundays, and he just wrote a very nice note about, um, which I think I can share here, just how nice it was to go. And, uh, he's how, a really good person. I, I love Rory. I think Aww, he's an amazing uh, human. Um, <laughs> it's just great to spend more time with him, too. And, you know, it's like, this is why I'm trying to have a 15 person company, too, because scaling culture is very hard and yes. it's very time consuming. And I think one of the things that I just didn't enjoy, and I don't have the aspiration to build a thousand person company anymore, to me, that is not fun. Yeah. And I know that about myself. Knowing people's kids' names, knowing people's spouses' names, having had dinner with them, going to a nice restaurant with them, although we didn't take Rory out to Key, which was arguably the best meal of your life by a factor of what, it five? A, it was a pretty good meal. That's I can't rub it in anymore. I can't Sorry, rub Rory. It in anymore. <laughs> We just, uh, but you know, I, epic. It was epic, yeah. And I, you know, creating those epic moments, you know, I, what I find is in a low unemployment market like we're experiencing right now, it hasn't always been this way. Uh, you know, people have choices, they can go to different places. All things considered, they want to go to a place they feel good every day going to. I've in the second half of my career, I've tried to make it like the best place you could show up and the best memories and the best people sitting next to you. If you get that right and the best food, if you get that right, like, well, there's a lot of places where you're sitting next to people you don't respect. There's a lot of places that are not fun. There are a lot of places that have bad food. So make it pleasant. As you're scaling too, it's, you know, the hiring, I, I don't think we can emphasize enough how important the hiring piece is because For the people sure. you're hiring are the ones that are perpetuating your culture. Yes. And one I, way or the other. And I will tell you, you know, it as our team, you know, it, it's grown from five to five 15. to fifteen. And, you know, when it's that it's small like that, you're you're with each other a lot. Yeah. A lot. And one of my very early experiences was it was just Jackie and I in the office and um, you know, she very much embodies the mission and core values that have not been defined, but really are and have been defined you they know, need not in be part in part by by Jackie. Yeah. Um, and she asked me a question and I gave her a very emphatic answer. And she said, are you sure? I said, yes, absolutely. And she said, good. I like strong opinions. Strong opinions yeah. are important. Yeah. My entire life, I dealt with people being like, oh, Ashley with her strong opinions again. And it was the first time I was really given permission yeah. to have strong opinions. And that's really part of our culture. It really, oh, really yeah. is. Oh, yeah. You better have an opinion here because I'm going to ask you. And if, and if you hadn't do? hired Jackie to perpetuate that, yeah. I wouldn't have really known that I could. It was at that moment. I'd been there probably yeah. three or four months. Then I knew, oh, I get to have an opinion. Yeah. I can speak up. Yeah. And so it's. The people you hire, it's it's very very important that you're that you're hiring I them based the, on. I this. had the same thing early in my career, and I attribute it to our blonde hair. People just don't take blonde seriously. My blonde yeah. hair is just always We're just too against. pretty. Is that what it is? It's the blonde hair thing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I used to wear glasses when I was I I did what? an experiment when I was like young when I was like I 21, 22 years old. I was on. walking down Canal Street. And I had read a study that people with glasses get taken more seriously. Uh -huh. And I used to buy my sunglasses there for a dollar or two dollars and they break and whatever. I lose them. And the one time I was walking by to get sunglasses, they had clear tortoise shell glasses. You know, like yeah. the guy in um, American Psycho wears, you know, tortoise shell was yeah. like the big thing in the 90s, 80s and 90s in New York. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll get those. Uh, and I got them and I just wore them to some meetings. And everybody took me more seriously from wearing <laughs> clear glasses. I bought I was, fake glasses in you junior had, high. You, you had, did too? You mm -hmm. had lenses in them, right? No, they had lenses, but they were <laughs> clear, clear, clear glass yeah, no, lenses. Of course. My point is they were not prescription. It would no, be I funny if you didn't have lenses. Yeah, that would be hysterical. Like, <laughs> that would be like, yeah, no, they didn't do that. Okay, the work environment. Here okay, we go. so I think a lot of people sort of conflate culture and foosball. happy hours and foosball. <laughs> and, <laughs> not but, culture. But it is it is something that can... It's important to use those types of things as ways to reward and attract the type of people you want to work yes. with yeah. and the pe the people that fit your culture. There's no foosball table here. There's no foosball table. There is a poker um, table. <laughs> and I am going to start playing with the management team. Oh, boy. Um, yep. Carry yeah, plays. Yes. No, that's, that's, that's scary. No, I'm, no, I'm totally I don't gamble. I'm there for that. 
I you're there, there for, for poker. Yeah. That's actually, I think more women should learn to play poker. I think it's actually, I'm going to teach my daughter. It makes me too anxious. Well, that's part of the reason is like, I think mm. it's sort of like, boy, when I grew up, boys were just beating the heck out of each other. They knew how to punch, they knew how to wrestle. And then when I was in my, yeah, when I was like in my 20s, I taught self-defense. And I was just astounded that women didn't know how to make a fist or throw a punch. Mm -hmm. And they would almost 100% of the time put their thumb inside yeah. their hand to punch it's and they would hit with the front of their fist. And I was like, you're gonna break your thumb. Let me show you how yeah. to throw a proper punch. Yeah. When I would show people how to throw a proper punch and they got the power behind it, I could just see like this total like uh, dopamine unlock, like, oh my God, I can knock somebody out. This is awesome. And I think poker is the same thing because poker is about intimidation, deception, strategy, math. And you think about like, you know, not, not being allowed to have an opinion, which I think probably was in part because you're female. Do you feel that way? Yeah, they, it's, yeah. Yes. Okay. It's a bit so, social I don't want to get into it, but yeah. Yeah, no, I do think that people maybe, especially when we were maybe 10 years ago, maybe take women less earth. Well, what woman has ever been rewarded for being aggressive, deceptive, or pushed towards math and strategy? Yeah. The, yeah, it doesn't. They push women away from math and strategy. Like literally, I see this mm -hmm. already with my nine-year-old. Yeah, interesting. And still, yeah, that's that surprises that's really me. Sad. Still a little bit, like you know, but she's not good at math, and I'm just like, okay, so are we going to triple down? And like, no, we'll get her, we'll get her to so bench. She's great at art. <laughs> what, uh, no, uh, there's a little bit of that actually, and uh, yeah. I'm optimizing, uh, and it, maybe I seem a little crazy, and I did get a couple of complaints on my Instagram, but I, I do think about the gender differences. Like, well, if she is going to be steered towards being passive. Um, I'm going to teach her how to use a gun, Crossbow. a bow and arrow. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take her on really long hikes and just teach her some of this other stuff so that she has that confidence. You know? How to be formidable. Just have a little bit of formidable. Yeah. And I taught her Taekwondo. She wasn't exactly into it, but you know, I taught her how to do a shotgun when she was six. I taught her sniper rifles. Like, Not that I'm pro, super pro-gun, but I do think... You know, it, it can at least take that edge off of like, you grew up in kind of the country, right? Like, was well, I grew up in a small town. I grew up in town, town, but where there are people learned how to use guns, I suppose. Oh yes, there were a lot yeah. of people in my high school that used guns. Yes, yeah, so you learned. Did you learn how to use a gun when you were younger? Uh, no, not until I was in college. Oh okay, I went out to yeah. Vegas. Oh, you went to Vegas and just did the like machine gun thing. No, no, no. You just, just... go out into the side of the highway and shoot and in, shoot <laughs> into the yeah. yeah. I'm going to advise anybody watching this <laughs> right now not to do that. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so with the work environment, <laughs> it is important to create an appealing workspace. Yeah. You don't have to have a foosball table, but you know, bringing in lunch for the team. Yeah, we do that. You, yeah, once a week. Yep. Snacks and lunches, doing um, snacks. you know, maybe a day off on the birthday or, you know, trip, you know, your yearly um, anniversary with the company, you get some kind of special mm -hmm. fun thing. Yeah. Um, you know, some some companies do like Wine Wednesdays or happy hours. Mm -hmm. Actually, speaking of Rory, he's doing uh, he's educating people on whiskey today. He's doing a whiskey yeah. tasting at the office. Mm -hmm. And those sort of things, they create an appealing workplace. Yeah. I'm not saying get hammered with your coworkers. No. But it, it, those types of rewards or yeah. workplace rewards are, are nice. Right. Um, th it's also important to, in the work environment, to perpetuate your culture culture to foster teamwork. Yeah. So this might be going doing offsites together. Yeah. This is we do something called barn raisings where we all sit down and and kind of brainstorm yeah. together. Something as simple as that it doesn't you don't have to be spending money, no. but but fostering teamwork yeah. um, and then letting everyone you know get stuff done on their own. I read a book called Anti Fragile. Mm -hmm. Anti-fragility by mm -hmm. Talib, I guess it, Nassim Talib. Uh, he also did the Black Swan, and I, you guys don't know this, but I revealed it to you in the Slack channel the other day. And I've worked really hard on making our organization an organization that would thrive in chaos mm -hmm. or a down market, and to be resilient mm -hmm. and anti-fragile. Mm -hmm. um, so an anti-anti-fragility -fra means. When things become more chaotic or things become more difficult, you perform better. Well, that's really interesting. So there are some people who are investors or traders who when there's volatility and uncertainty, they do better mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And so- They see opportunity. They see opportunity. And so you each know how to do each other's jobs. Well. 
Jamont. I don't know that I know how to do Jackie's right job. If I asked you to do it, you do it at 60 or 70 <laughs> percent, which yeah, he did. Yeah. Jamont did the syndicates at 80 or 90 percent of what you did. Jackie ran the accelerator with me. Now Jamont runs the accelerator. So mm -hmm. if Jackie had to run the accelerator, we, it would be a problem. So you start doing going back and forth on that. You'll see every position here has at least one, if not two people, redundancy. So you get two different people who look at the project. So right. I, I always encourage people when you're thinking about that because it makes you sleep much better at night knowing that multiple team members have overlap in their sure. responsibility or skill set ability. Yeah. It really works. Tools, here we go. So we're rounding the horn now. Is this slide seven? Yes, this is this the last is the seven. end. Yes. Okay, here we go. Tools can be very, very helpful on a number of different, um, you know, across a, a number of, of different topics and fields. Sure. Um, as it as it pertains to culture, we sort of broken it down to three different categories. Um, team communications, um, really, really uh, important to keep everyone on the same page. Uh, and and depending on if you're a you know, Slack is free for a lot of, um, for up, up to a certain point. They have a freemium model. I'm not exactly even sure yeah. what that is. And but, if you pay for it, it's cheap. So Right. And then, you know, Gchat could also be yeah. a solution for a small team. Um, and then as you start to scale a bit, you might need to bring in, you know, a, com you know, a, a so software like Monday or Asana yeah. that really helps you keep organized. It has to-do lists. You can share what you're working on with other you people. All stuff. Yeah, Asana. Um, yeah. and, and so... You want to pick tools that speak to your culture and will enhance the work experience for your team. Mm. And, you know, you have a lot of options, but these are those are a few that we really like. Yeah, I am. Uh, I like Asana uh, for a GSD culture. I like it for uh, especially for re repetitive tasks. Like if we do an episode of This Week in Startups 100 times a year, having a checklist is super beneficial because 100 times 20 items is 2,000 checks. Mm -hmm. If you don't check them off, you might forget. It's kind of mm -hmm. hard to keep it all in memory. The checklist manifesto up here. Yeah, and, and we, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Oh, is it over here? It's right there. Oh, I love the <laughs> right behind you. We've never it's, had the, fact, we never had the author of that on the show, have we? We have not. Let's invite the author. Yeah. I would like to. Done. It's it's a good book. Okay, feedback fifteen five we talked about. It's great. And there's lattice tribal metrics we invested in. Mm -hmm. Fifteen five we invested in. So feedback is great. Um, I don't know about minute to minute feedback. Like some people are doing daily texts and like, how are you feeling at work today? It's a little bit much, but mm -hmm. we'll see. Uh, hiring, we talked about Textio a bit. Um, great, uh, just analyzes your job description to see if any of your jargon jumps out as being overly masculine or feminine and just sort of, and also suggests sort of alternatives for how people might respond better. Awesome. Breezy. Yeah, Breezy is just a tool that helps you, helps you hire. It, yeah. You know, you can post your, um, post the ad and then it, Sends organizing. it out to different, yeah, organizes, sends it out to different platforms that yeah. could be beneficial. And it's it helps keep you organized as opposed to posting something on Craigslist. And then you yeah. lose the resumes in your inbox. And yeah. Zip Recruiter just, we've used. Yeah. Uh, LinkedIn jobs, Angelist yep. jobs, tons of different places to find great people. I think the most important thing is to write uh, a job description from the heart yeah. that really parallels the culture. Yeah. Uh, and then really take your time. Hire slow, fire fast. You know when you've made a mistake. Just get that person out of there. Yeah. Man, waiting is always a mistake. <laughs> right. It doesn't get better. It, it, it you never. You think like, yeah. You think might. like, oh, wow, this person, you know, doesn't <laughs> show up oh, for work and doesn't thing. do their EOD. Yeah. Like, we can convince them to do it. It's like, mm -hmm. really? Can we? Not so much. Like, not so much, right? Like, you can help people be 10% better at anything. 20% is going to take a lot of effort. And that's it. You know, people are what they are, I think. Like, they can, people can get 10, 20% better. I don't know, philosophically. Yeah. 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 May not be worth your time. All right. Okay. Well, there you have it, folks. Yeah. Culture. <laughs> I think we've had a pretty good culture here. I think we've done a good job. It can always get better. Yeah, sure. But we should definitely set the, we should definitely, um, Definitely uh, take the medicine and do the yeah, that's a great the idea. values because the values would be really be able would be great if we could say one two or three on the values like because we I do stop people in the company say tell me the mission and 
It's very easy. Support mm -hmm. founders and inspire innovation. Super easy mission. All right, listen, uh, this has been a great 10-part series. Really proud of it. We've gotten tremendous feedback. It's not all the answers, but it's a framework uh, for you to think about your company. And you can see all 10 episodes very easily and the deck at thisweekinstartups.com slash scale. All 10 episodes are there. Uh, it's about 15 hours of content. And it's just all the basics. And it just gives you some framework for thinking about some tools. And the links are in the decks. And it's one giant deck that's got to be at this point. <laughs> How big is this goddamn deck? <laughs> well, it's, it's seven We put a lot of work into times this. Ten. Oh, that's true. You're right. It's actually <laughs> it's manageable. Seven times ten. It's manageable. <laughs> we know it's manageable. These are we did longer. one of these every week or two. Yeah. So we spaced it out. Um, and we'll, we should keep uh, iterating on this. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Sir Charles, Master Nick. Uh, thank you, Ashley and Jackie, for coming on the prog thank program. You. I know... Uh, that's something I've been talking about, career development. I've been pushing you guys to be speakers and speak at events, not your so natural. Uh, you'd never done that before, had you? Like public speaking uh, and that, a little that bit. scale? A long time ago. And I, in front of a thousand people? I was senior class president, Jason. I spoke at my what? high school graduation. You were senior class president? I'm very... I didn't know you were storied and <laughs> no. really. I didn't know you were senior class. President. I stand really? for Ashley. Yeah. Was that an election? <laughs> yes. How many people were in your class? How many people voted? One hundred and ninety. That's incredible! Wow. My yeah. brother Josh, my little brother, was class president uh -huh. while I was still in the school. Oh boy. So I was a year ahead of him. Well, so was he ASB or was he class? He was class president while I was a senior. Yeah, I was ASB class president. What does it mean? ASB is the associate student body. Ah. So it's the whole that governs the entire high school, whereas then you have class presidents too. No, no, he won. So he was junior class so president your senior year. Uh, my senior year. Yeah. So yeah. like literally I have to go hear my little brother <laughs> give his speech for the direct. And everybody's like, eh, listen to your brother. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. I love you, Josh. Okay, let's put a bow on it here. We're going to wrap it up. Um, if uh, you want to help the podcast, very simple way to do that. Just tell your friends about it. If you know an entrepreneur, say, hey, I know this great podcast where you can learn and there's a almost a thousand episodes in the archive now. Go to thisweekinstartups.com or youtube.com slash thisweekin. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>